Um, welcome to um, the last lecture for the social justice chapter. All right, so this is the last section or, of content in the chapter. Um, and uh, we're going to study um, environmental justice. So this is an analytical study of environmental justice. In broad outline, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to review some past environmental stuff from chapter one, okay? Sit so to remind you a few things, and then we'll jump into the chapter uh, two material. Um, and uh, at the, starting next week, we start the second half of the book by starting the development strategies chapter. And in particular, we'll start out with uh, Jeffrey Sachs's book, um, The End of Poverty, okay? Then we'll go to Bill Easterly's book, um, The White Man's Burden. And then we'll uh, go to Banerjee and Duffalo's book, Poor Economics. Okay, so we have a very full week next week. These are some really top experts in the field. I think it's good to study what they say uh, about because they've you know been on the ground, worked in the large um, in organizations like the World Bank or the UN, um, and uh, have some very interesting perspectives. Okay. So that's where, well, that's sort of where we're going. Okay, so um, remember in chapter one, I overviewed um, in the environment and pollution in particular. We talked about air pollution uh, of a number of forms like CO2 emissions um, and uh, climate change. We talked some about um, and how this is, you know, becoming more and more of a problem. Talk about water pollution, such as things like ocean acidification, okay, um, and many other forms of water pollution in lakes, etc. Um, and we talked about soil pollution that comes from a whole range of things, like agriculture and mining and so forth. Okay, so that was to try to set the stage for saying there is a problem. Okay. Then we talked about the notion of sustainability. That is, basically, let's try to do things for ourselves now in a way that we don't screw up the possibility of our children to have what we have, okay? And their children, and their children, and their children, okay? And uh, it's, a, it's a very important idea, um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of good reasons to be very concerned about that issue. Um, in particular, we talked about planetary boundaries. Now, the planetary boundaries studies are fascinating. Um, these the boundaries are, are basically say, in these various categories, when are we going beyond the limits of what Earth can support? When have we irreparably damaged Earth? Okay? And unfortunately, we've already done it. Okay? In two areas in particular, in biodiversity, we're killing off species at a very high rate. And of course, the problem if you're killing off species, well, they don't come back, okay? Um, the next one is, is the nitrogen, cy nitrogen cycle is really problematic. There's warning signs for th other, other areas. Uh, a lot of people are concerned about climate change because if you think about it, you know, the climate's like a little bit important because we're all breathing the air, you know? I mean, we're all together, we're all linked. Next, we went into the notion of the ecological footprint. You did a homework problem on your personal footprint, um, and somebody had said they were a 4.3. I'm a 3.7. I don't know what you were, but um, you know th this is uh, problematic because you know if Kevin's a, a, a 3.7, uh, does anybody number the num remember the number of global hectares that uh, we can each have in order to still um, you know not screw up the earth? Does anybody remember the number? 1.8. So I'm way over. If everybody in the world lived like me, it would be a disaster. Okay. Um, so so it's really um, quite a problem. And you remember we watched that movie off of the, the Eco Footprint website, and it had the relationship between the evolution of the ecological footprint and the evolution of the human development index. So what it basically showed is, is that we have a big problem because as we um, as HDI goes up, ecological footprint goes up. We need the footprint to be low, and we need the HDI to be high. High HDI is typically thought of as, as 0 0.7 or above, or thought of the developing world. Okay, but all the developing world people 
Okay, let's say that's, what is it, 10% of the Earth. Um, <laughs> they're polluting like mad, like we do in the U.S. Okay, so this comes brings us to this very, very basic issue of, do you really want to be in humanitarian engineering and help end poverty? Because what's it going to do to you? Are you going to have to start cutting back? Throw away, get rid of your car, start riding a bicycle to work in these cold days. You know, start recycling. Stop eating beef. And you can think of a whole list of things, okay? And some of those can be upsetting. I mean, so we are, we're going to be uh, likely running into some pretty major challenges as, as uh, humanity moves forward on the sustainability issue. Uh, you watched uh, as part of Home to One, uh, um, jo Jeffrey Sachs' is, uh, The Age of Sustainability at Coursera, and he has his free book, as you, as you noticed, to a reference. Um, uh, I think he speaks very eloquently about it. He's, he's, he gave a talk last year at OSU on that, actually. I went to the talk, fantastic talk. There's nobody like him in terms of his ability to talk about every place on the planet. It's just weird. I mean, he's got incredible travel and insight, broad view. So just to give you an idea. After the talk, I went up and talked to him, and, and, and I was talking to this gentleman from Africa, from Ghana, and, and, and or no, I was talking to Jeff Sachs, and the guy, my friend from Ghana comes up, and they say hi to each other, and he goes, well, where are you from in Ghana? And he names, he goes, you never know, it's just a little village. He names a village, and Jeff Sachs says, I was a village right next to, and I know these people named this, this, and this, and this guy knew them. I mean, wow, okay? Um, so, you know, what's going to really make this challenging, though, is not just everybody in the world getting rich, which means we're going to pollute more, because we consume more. Right? If you're living on a dollar a day, you're eating just a little bit of food, you're not polluting much, right? But people like me, I'm, I'm eating chipotle burritos every day, you know? I mean, uh, and chocolate almond ice cream, so you too back there. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm polluting a lot more. And, and then the other problem is, is we all like to make babies, right? Or some of us do. And population's going up, right? And that makes more people that pollute more, right? So, so this is, these two issues, development and population increase, really are going to create a heavy load on the planet. And uh, the outlook is, I don't know if you, some people would say it's grim. Some people would say, well, we need to start thinking very carefully about what we're doing now. It's really going to change things. Um, Jeffrey Sachs' um, title of his book is really appropriate, The Age of Sustainability. He's basically saying... We've come to an epoch um, on Earth that we have to think very carefully about destroying Earth so that we can all, uh, we've got we to do things much more carefully. I think he's right that it's, it's fundamentally different. Okay, next we talked in the last chapter about the tragedy of the commons. So there's many examples of the commons. The climate that we're all living in now is the commons, right? We pollute the commons, right? We destroy the commons. But other people would say the commons are things like a cow pasture that's, that's shared by a group of people, a uh, community garden, a, a forest, a lake with fish in it. Okay, fisheries is a great example of the commons. So the question is, what is the tragedy? The tragedy is simple. The tragedy says, I'm going to go there and I'm going to get a fish and I go sell the fish. Well, that was good for me, man. You know, I was able to buy a little radio and a TV or whatever. So I can, I'm, I'll go get more fish. But the problem is everybody else is doing the same thing. Before you know it, all the fish are gone. And guess what? They can't reproduce. It's dead. It's the tragedy occurred. There's no possibility for renewal. Okay? So that's that's what happens when there's a tragedy. So we um, uh, had a model for that, a mathematical model, and it's it's sitting right here. So let's start out and, and discuss this model. Um, let's pick it apart. Let U, big U, be zero. That's utilization. Okay, just act as though nobody's going to the commons and eating. And then ask yourself, what is then RK plus 1 equal RK times this e to the R, 1 minus RK, K? Okay, so the way to study this is, um, is to look at every little term. Let's not worry about little r and big K yet, but let's just ask the question, you know, well, what could we know? Um, one thing we could know here is, is that you remember that e to the zero is what? One. It's a nice little fact. Let's use it. One minus rk over k 
If I make that equal to zero, I'll have e to the zero, right? So how do I get, well, rk, rk over k equal to one? Well, that would be rk equal k, right? So if rk is equal to k, consider that. That means in that case, when rk is equal to k, I've got e to the zero is one. Well, if RK, then I got it times rk. Well, that's k. So rk plus one is k. So look what it just did. It said that if, if rk ever becomes k, it's going to stay at k for all future k. Okay? That's what we had called carrying capacity. That's a traditional term from um, theoretical ecology. Um, you don't need to worry about really what it means. But um, the point is, is that that equation, when u is equal to 0, will somehow end up as k. All right? Nobody clear about that? Second of all, the little r. What is the little r going to do to me in that equation? Well, the first thing to do is consider if it's 0. Well, if it's 0, then it's e to the 0 again, and blah, blah, blah. Crank it up just a little bit. Make, e, uh, make r just a really small number. Well, if that's a really small number, then that 1 minus rk over k is going to be, even for any value of rk, is going to be a really small number near 0. And therefore, um, it's going to not change. It's going to be a small number. And therefore, it's not going to change much. And therefore, your, your rk is, uh, that's, how, that's not very clear. R, RK is going to move slower. So what's going to happen is, is if you crank R up, you're going to, you've got, here's the way to think about it. It's E to the whatever, right? And you know that, what does that look like? What is, if you plot that on the axis like this, it, E to zero is one, so it starts at one here and it goes up, right? Just like this. But how does the shape of that curve change when R changes? If R is small, it's like this. If R is big, it's like this, right? I mean, so it, it controls the rate, okay? So that's, that controls the rate of change. So we took our little r, big k. Now, the, the issue here next, though, is we want to put in u because that's the interesting case, right? We're all going to the fishery and find, getting fish out of the pond. So what happens, let's, uh, let's keep things simple. Don't make it vary with k, just make it a constant, u of k a constant. So what's going to happen every time is in the equation, just multiply the rk through. The first term, we know what it's doing. It's going like this, up to k. The second term is going to be minusing off rk. So as rk increases, it's going to go down. So it's going to make it go up less. That's all it does. Okay, that's all it does. Now we're gonna simulate in a minute, um, but that's basically what it is. You, you could easily write in a computer program in MATLAB, take that equation, write, wrap the four next loop around it, create the variables and plot them, right? That's, and that's all I'm gonna be doing. Okay, now the dynamics. So here's our dynamics. I'm not gonna, uh, this is a plot just from previous slide. Um, the left-hand column plots I'm not going to get into. Uh, I already did that. Uh, the right-hand top ones, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a low, I'm going to say low utilization. So what I mean by that is I pick UK to be a small number. And then I start for initial R case, and I just run the simulation multiple times. And that's all those colored plots up there on the top. And you see what happens is it goes to, R, it goes to K. K here was 50. So it goes to 50, okay? If it's below, if it starts below 50, it goes up to 50. If it starts above, it goes down to 50, okay? The purple guy right here is the, um, what I'm gonna say is the trip point, and it, that is uh, when you've destroyed the commons, okay? In other words, if RK goes below that point, then I've destroyed the commons, okay? So. What I do then is I simply take u of k and let it be a bigger constant so everybody's like fishing more. Everybody's utilizing it more. Then 
we get a tragedy, okay? And a decrease below the threshold, okay? Now that, that gets us uh, ready um, for the next step. Um, any questions? So that, that's uh, stuff from chapter one. Okay, um, next. Remember two from chapter one though. Individual utilization is UI. The total utilization was UK. And it's constrained. It, 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 according to this equation here, um, total utilization has got to be greater or equal to zero. It can't be negative. It's just the sum of the individual utilizations. And it's got to be less than or equal to one. So can somebody remember why I mean, obviously, utilization has to be positive. That's, that's clear. But why, is that, why does it have to be less than 1, less than or equal 1? Krista? Because if it was 1, it would be all the resources gone at once. In one step. Exactly. You, perfect. And if you go back to this equation right here, it's actually clear. Because if this guy... Um, you're going to, this is where, where that comes in. If this is one, then you're, you're minusing off RK, right? Um, and, uh, well, if, if uh, yeah, it's going to, the right way, the right way is to think about it, the easiest way is the way you said it. And in particular, you want to think about those numbers, UIs, as percentages. So if we have the end people in this room, everybody's got their UI, it's a percentage expressed in decimal form. You know, I, I, let's say I'm a heavy user, so I'm 0.1, you're 0 0.01, 0 0.015, 0 0.015, and they all have to sum up to one or, or less, <coughs> okay? If we are using too much, as Krista said, in one step, it's all gonna be gone. But if we use less, then we have a chance of the renewal g going up and us pushing it down at a lower rate so that we won't destroy the commons, okay? Now, what I'm gonna assume is that there's individual utilization dynamics and I'm gonna let them occur according to the same equation. So, why did I pick this model? You, you know what this model looks like. It simply looks like utilization like this. That's all it does. Okay, and what the, if it starts out, what value does it end up? UI, where does it end up as k goes to infinity? Use my notation. No, no, not zero. What? KUI, yes, yes, exactly. It ends up at KUI. And the slope of this guy here is dictated by? Alex, you can do it. RUI, exactly, RUI. Okay, so, so um, different people have different utilization dynamics um, over time. If I'm richer, this KUI will be higher, right? If I'm poorer, my KUI might be lower, but if I'm getting rich pretty fast, my RUI might be higher and I might go like this. Some people... Um, that are really ecologically conscious and try to minimize their footprint um, actually will keep their KUI low even if they're in a rich country, right? You know, the person that rides their bicycle all the time, one of my very good old friends. <coughs> um, <coughs> so, now what I got to get you to do is think about having a bunch of people all with different utilizations like this, okay? So everyone in the room has one of those, for instance. Next, um, this is what we just said, um, that if UI of zero is less than KUI, then UI will go up. If it's greater than it, it goes down. Now, I want to talk about that case a little bit. If I go back to this fig, can someone tell me why is it on the top plot that if I start above the carrying capacity K, K my initial condition, why does it come down? Going up makes sense. The equations say that. But why does it come down? It's, it's a little tricky, actually. 
Think about it in terms, uh, what's a good example? Maybe the fisheries example. This is why we use math to describe dynamics. Yes? Yeah, like for like, for like the fish example, it would, it would be the case where there's not enough food to support that much, that many fish. So it will come down to the value. Of That's a fine way to think about it. Um, but change, change your thinking for fish being there and you're fishing at a certain rate. So you start out with a bunch of fish, real high number, and you've got a, a certain rate of fishing why is it that if it's really high, it will go down? Why is that? Yes? The rate of renewal isn't fast enough to keep up. Exactly. It's all about that. That's just, a, that's just stating what you said a different way. Okay? Because your, your statement is exactly what's said in ecology. Okay? So, indeed, um, it, these dynamics you know, make sense in terms of what you find um, in nature. Um, of course, if you start right at that K value, KUI, whatever, it'll just stay there, okay? Um, okay, next. So each user, I've said that the users go to the common resource, the commons, and they get some benefit for going to that commons and getting the resource either because they eat it themselves or because they sell it. I mean, you know, that's what's happening all over the world. Oil. Oil is a classic example of a common, the commons, a resource. It's just that not very many people can get it. And so the big rich oil companies get it, make lots of money off it, but they're destroying the commons, right? Of course they are. We're going to run out of oil, and people predict 100 years. Um, now, the question is, though, why are they doing it? Well, we need our math to tell us something about what's the benefit to each user. So the benefit to each user is actually pretty easy to see. It's UIRK, because that's the percentage of the resource that I gets at time K, okay? Now, the thing is, is if I raise my utilization, my UI, well, then my benefit goes up. Ooh, that's bad, because everybody will want to raise their utilization, right? But if everybody starts raising utilization, R goes down. Right? See the trickiness? So if R is going down, that hurts everybody. So everybody doesn't get as much benefit done. Okay? Now, for this simulation, what I'm going to sort of think about this as, rather than using RI, UI, RK, I'm just going to use UI. And the reason is, is, is because R is the same for everybody, so the benefit's proportional to UI, the proportionality being dictated by R. Okay, even though it's time varying, I'm just going to think of it that way. Okay, now the reason I needed to define benefits is because I need to define inequality of benefits. Remember, we had money before. We're talking about passing money around a poor community. Now we're going to be worried about is everybody getting equal benefits from the commons? Okay, things like that. So one goal could be an environmental justice. Um, should we have equal utilization? Should it be that we're all, by law, for instance, only allowed to utilize a common resource a certain amount and cap it at that? So um, we do that in this country. We call them EPA standards sometimes. We call them the CARB standards on cars for pollution. Of course. You may not agree with those standards because they have such a wide variance. I mean, allow everything from a, a Prius to a, a Humvee, a, a Hummer, right? I mean, so they're not like real restrictive, <laughs> okay? But we do have some of that going on um, now. Another more realistic goal might be to have approximately equal utilizations. Um, because how, how can you, does it really make sense to equalize utilization? So my old friend, Tom Waite from He's a biologist over here at OSU. He rode his bike everywhere for years and years and years, okay? Tom's utilization was way low. I mean, he grew a garden in his front yard, had solar panels all over his house. Uh, on his house, I, he was ecologically about as sound as you could get, okay? Because it was a lifestyle choice for him and he felt it was very important, okay? Now, I'm not gonna be able to achieve what he's achieved, 
I mean, no, you know, no way. So my point is, is that equalizing my utilization to Tom's utilization is not realistically going to happen. If somebody wants to have a low utilization, fine. Furthermore, if you're in a developing country, developing country and you're really poor, you're typically not going to have high, high utilization. And, well, I mean, how, if I gave them utilization, they wouldn't be able to use it anyway. Like the concept of utilization. So you see, it's a lot different than money. You can't just easily pass around utilization like we can pass money around, okay? Um, one typical goal might be simply to put an upper bound and say everybody has to have a utilization like this. Now, this could be in, expressed in different formats. It could be that we put a law that says you can do whatever you want, but your ecological footprint has to be less than 1.8. I mean, you think that's going to make it through Congress? <coughs> yeah, right. Okay, so... so uh, but there's a lot of ways to think about what's fair in terms of environmental justice. Now remember, I'm trying to connect here to the social justice principles we talked about earlier. We didn't get into a lot of the detail on that, but um, there, there are, are treatments of the environmental justice cases, if you are interested in those, in the uh, Catholic social doctrine case, in the, uh, um, and Marcia Sens, um, case he talks about how environmental justice and it's in the engineering ethics case okay so one of the religious two of the to the secular it's a little bit in the islamic case too um so i'm trying to use some connect these ideas to those two okay so you know it's it's nice when you're sitting on your computer and relaxing in a coffee shop you can invent any law you want you don't have to fight with John Boehner or something in Congress. So what you do is you think, start thinking about how it would be to set a policy so that everybody's utilizations that are all time varying and dynamic will get equalized to some sense. So here's one possibility. I'm going to set some value you see, I'm thinking of that you cap, okay? And it's, I'm going to let it be a constant for, for this chapter. Next chapter, I'm going to make UC time vary. Now, if someone's utilization is less than UC, this number I set, well, then I let UI k plus 1 be this formula. Now, look, whenever you look at these formulas, you get used to looking at these min formulas. So this is typically going to be the big number. So minning will typically pick this value. But if this value goes over this one, it's going to pick this one. So this is, this is I always say, it's chopping the top off that function. Okay? So that this UI will never go over this number. Okay? Now, that's just the utilization formula sitting there, right? That we already talked about. So we're going to allow everybody, the world can develop. Okay? Everybody can start getting rich and polluting more. But... We're going to cap when they get to a certain limit. We say, that's it. You can't use any more. You can't pollute more in the environment. You can't use more of the fishery. You can't use more of the field, whatever. Okay? So that's a very simple idea, right? On the other hand, the problem is you got the 10% of the world that's polluting like mad. That's all us. So the what, question is, what do you do with them? That's, the hard, that's another hard question. So. I can arbitrarily invent laws, so here's my law. If you're above the cap, then at the next step, um, you can be at the cap plus the difference between UI and UC times alpha, where alpha is a, a number between zero and one. Now, if you think about that, that's actually a very easy formula. What it says is, rid it, this is like a little bit like this generosity parameter. Take the difference between the between the cap and where you're at and reduce it by some percentage, right? It's, it's like that generosity parameter, pass half the difference. Here, I can pick alpha to be 0.52. That would say reduce your utilization by 50% of how much you're over the cap at one step, okay? As long as alpha is in that range, as k goes to infinity, this will do what? What will UIK do? It, it'll go to UC automatically. So, event, so I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to be a little soft. 
I got a bunch of big rich people, including like mad. You better be nice to them or they're not going to listen to you anyway. So you say, slowly reduce to the cop if you're over. Okay? And then if you're at the cap, you can stay at the cap. The question is, what's the effects of a policy like this? Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick UC equal 0 0.001, and then I'm going to pick alpha equal 0 0.6. Um, I, it could have used any reasonable number. And then I'm going to consider a number of cases here. I'm going to consider when I have the policy in place, when I don't have the policy in place, when I have uh, high and low populations. Okay, so here's the, the fun plot. Um, so let's uh, look at the top left plot. This is um, the utilizations, UIK, I equal 1 to N. Um, and uh, whatever unit, it's some time step along the horizontal axis. You could call it years if you want or decades, whatever. Uh, but you see the shapes of those plots. Everybody's kind of moving up, right? But they're all moving up at different rates because I, I use random number generator to pick the rates and the capacities within a range. So every time you run the sim, it's different. Okay? So that's with no policy. Now, the one right to its right with the green line, the green line's you see. Okay? The big, thick green line, just so you can't miss it. Um, and you see the guys below. Well, a lot of them are going up, they're hitting the green line, they're not going over. But some are staying down, the Tom Waits of the world, or the poor people of the world, either one, and they're never hitting the utilization barrier, okay? And the, the rich people at the top are polluting like mad, well, it comes down, right? So, is that justice? Well, I, I, I mean, I don't have equal utilization, but I've equalized it more. I, in other words, I, I brought the world to a better state in the sense of how equal the utilizations are because the plot on the right clearly has more equality to it than the one on the left. Okay? Um, I kept those on the uh, same axes this way. You see that? So this is the, the amount of uh, inequality in utilization in the world or world of, of uh, 200 users here uh, compared to the, the big one on the left. Okay? Um, now, so we've equalized things. Um, the total utilization, which is simply the sum, so I'm going to take all of the plots on the top left, I'm going to sum them up of every k, and I'm going to call the red right there that sum. Okay? Then I'm going to take the sum of these guys, and I'll plot them in the blue, which is kind of interesting because you notice that in the beginning, <laughs> utilization goes down. Why? Because the rich people have to bring their utilizations down, but then it kind of comes up just a little bit and it sticks right there, okay? So that's total utilization. Now, the key plot's the bottom right. So in the bottom right, I put my 20 value here, and under uh, no policy, that's the red over here, I get this red guy, and I get a tragedy, okay? there's no policy because what I'm doing is, I'm, this is the case where you have top left plot, red line below it, high utilization, destroying the columns. Perfectly now, this is chapter one. But let's turn on the policy now. If you turn on the policy, you're using top right plot, blue total utilization, bottom left plot, and then you get blue guy right here, okay? And we don't get a tragedy of the commons, so by, by regulating in this manner, we succeeded, right? We not only, I mean, we, you saved the planet. I mean, isn't that wonderful? All in one little computer simulation. It's the concepts that matter. Clearly, this doesn't match real data, okay? The point is, is that um, if we can come up with environmental justice policies, we can affect what's going to happen, okay? But it required uh, you know, two key things. The polluters had to reduce, number one. Uh, number two, if you're starting to get richer, you had to be capped at some point. 
Those were the two key elements of making this work, okay? Okay, questions? So, those are 200 users. Let's start making babies. Let's double it. So I'll just make n equal 400. So I'm gonna do everything the same. I just, in the simulation, just go n equal 400. Okay, now you just get a, lot, a whole lot of plots in the upper left, okay? Um, makes a really pretty picture. And then this guy basically looks the same, right? It's just a high density of lines. It, you know it's gonna work, right? The problem is, is that if you go back and look at the various numbers, this red guy's like this guy and the blue guy's like the other one, but it's not the same. Because just look at the, just the bottom left plot goes up to, what value does it go up to? Maybe uh, 0.9 and uh, the, the, on the red. On the blue, it's, it's going to just below 0.4. Go back. Ah, ouch. Look at the difference. In this plot, red only went up to 0.5. Blue was down there just below 0.2, not 0.4. So the utilizations are way higher, right? Well, I went from n equal 200 people to 400 people. You expect it to go up. Everybody needs to eat and pollute. I mean, if you live, you pollute, right? I mean, everybody, I mean, you consume and you pollute. Um, unfortunately, the raisin population gave a, gives us a problem. The red really goes down to zero, okay? But even the blue, I, it just happened that when I doubled it, 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 it's right below it. So both the tragedy occurred. So how do I fix it? I mean, it's, it's depressing, but how do I fix it? How can I fix this? Yes? You lower your UC. Exactly. I can grab UC and I can lower that guy. It's easy. What's the problem? I mean... This is assuming we double the population. Does anybody know what the population of Earth is going to be? Uh, Malthus thought he could guess years ago, and uh, based on exponential population growth, when everybody was like doom and gloom, that's not turning out to be the case. Right now, projections are about nine billion within what thirty or fifty years. I forget the numbers. Okay, and. Uh, and the, the reason it's kind of leveling off, does anybody know why? Some of the major reasons? One of the major reasons is women's rights. It's very clear. And as, as countries develop, they stop having so many babies. I mean, compare Italy to, well, pick your developing country. Okay, has a huge difference. We're going to get into why those things are happening um, when we talk. Um, Next week, about the development economist perspectives of Sachs, Easterly, and Benergy and Duffalo. Okay, so things aren't looking good, but still, I want an answer. I mean, you know, you say lower you see, I mean, let's be a little more precise. Like what? So, I mean, isn't the issue that your UC is dependent on your population? So, like, it's a function of your population? Yeah. And you don't know what N, N is going to be. Ooh, tough problem. How are you going to solve it? Yes. Um, have a cap per family instead of per person. A cop per family rather than per person. Not Ooh, encourage people not to have babies. Yeah. Wow. Draconian. <laughs> uh, no, come on. I, I, I'm trying to get you to do a little extension here. You don't know what N's going to be. I mean, but you do know a lot here. We can, let's just assume we know all the UI values. Everybody's utilization. Okay, like you have to report your taxes. You got to report your utilizations. Okay, uh, I know R. I know RK. I want to adjust U C so that it will change based on N. What do I want? I mean, just tell me roughly. If if N goes up, you told me I want U C to go down. But if N goes down, what do I do then? Exactly, UC should go up. What does that sound like? The theme of the, one of the themes in this course. 
No? Eh. I... This is where we're going to go. This is the net chapter 3 and chapter 3. Okay, so it's going to take a couple weeks. Alex? So there's going to be a critical value of total utilization that will make it so that you're just above destroying the commons. You take that, you divide it by n, that's your cap. So, okay, so you're, that's your way you're going to do the computation. In other words, you, you assume you can measure n. You don't know what it's going to be, but at any time k, you can measure n. Right. I think that would work. Yeah. You going to code it? Sure. Okay. <laughs> and I think you're right. I think that'll work. Of course, you just offset a little bit to keep it up rather than making it just hit it. Right. But you can do that. I think you're right. There's another way, though. What you just said, though, is what I'm getting at. But there's another way than that that's kind of, uh, well, just as easy, I guess. It's feedback control. It's feedback control. You control UC in order to keep yourself above that point. That's what we'll do at the end of chapter three, okay? All right, a um, few conclusions. Uh, it can avoid the tragedy of the commons. So if people get richer, utilization by them will undoubtedly go up, their parameters go up, and this can cause a tragedy. And of course, if the population n increases too much, the tragedy will definitely occur. So this EGJP needs to be modified to cope with changes due to development and population increases. More on this later. See, the problem is, you see that last sentence is only partly getting at what we discussed. Because the other problem is the KUI can go up and the RI can go up. Then it's a harder to come up with strategy like you're saying. It was just an, yeah. All right. So we, we, can, uh, we can deal with that. Um, question. I'm just going to leave a few remarks here. We took a certain approach to this, but why didn't we start doing things like the wealth distribution strategy and start trading utilizations? I mean, and paying each other for utilizations, like cap and trade. Um, I think you could invent a strategy like that in spite of the problems with the inability to pass utilization. I think it could work. I think you can in integrate a democracy here with no problem. It would work with no problem. Uh, a few analysis concepts I want to just briefly mention for a minute. These analysis concepts um, I'm using all the time. They're like in my head when I'm thinking about this. Uh, number one is stability. Um, it's a, a crucial idea. Uh, we used it when we got, uh, we were asymptotically getting equal wealth in the PID financial advisor. You know, it, 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 the actual wealth converged to the desired wealth. And if it perturbed off it, it went back. Okay, it stayed. There's boundedness, and that was what we just did. Um, this is where we have all um, utilizations end up under a preset value. It's actually a specific kind of boundedness called uniform ultimate boundedness. Um, sensitivity robustness is what you sort of your whole objective of feedback control. So, so our uh, results um, sensitive to various values like n. So what we're going to show in the next chapter is, is guess what? We're going to be able to change n, n our, by big amounts and that uh, feedback controller will adjust the UC value up and down so that we don't ever have a tragedy. Okay? It's robust to a change in n. Next, optimization. I, I talked about that when I discussed democracy. That really what's going on there is, is a, a, a form of distributed optimization. Very standard ideas have been used in engineering. In fact, some people view um, you know, design. If, you, if anybody says, you want, you want to say, somebody says, what do engineers do to you? What you should answer is design or invent. So if we design, what does design mean? It means you're trying to pit, create something under constraints and create the best thing, right? The best technology, et cetera. That's optimization. Okay, so optimization is inherent to everything we're doing in engineering. Okay, um, anyway, so we're going to uh, stop